stay hungry, stay foolish. Our guest today brings us a powerful blend of cross-disciplinary research and battle-tested tools to help us diagnose, design and implement a reinvention system that allows our companies to stop combating or resisting change and instead helps us to turn every disruption into our greatest opportunities. We welcome author of the Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook, How to Thrive in Chaos, Dr. Nadia Zhekzenbaeva. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much and a beautiful pronunciation of my very difficult last name. I'm honored to be back. Very important name, let's say as well, because last time we spoke, I, I call it a blockchain name. So maybe let's share that because I love your name and how it contains so much information. Well, uh, I appreciate that, that nickname. I think it's very smart. It is a blockchain name. It's a Kazakh name, traditional, and it gives you information on my tribe, my cast, the region I'm from, the gender, the day of birth of my last ancestor who had uh, that name, great-grandfather and so on. So it's a very important information for my local community. You can get a lot from that name. And I keep it because my family has given a lot to survive and be here. So I feel like I need to bring it still into existence. It kind of gives rise to why you do what you do, Nadia, because you have reinvention in your blood because your family has to re had to reinvent to survive essentially and this goes right back through many generations very much so so i really didn't have time to think about it most of my life and a couple of years ago uh, i was sitting in california right before going on stage and the person who was introducing me kept saying that i need to speak about the personal story and why i do what i do and I was just uh, making the mark of uh, 40 years at that point. And I'm like, it took me 40 years to figure out why I do what I do, which is um, my family comes from a very disrupted region. Kazakhstan lost 40% of its population uh, due to genocide between 1920s and 1930s in Kazakhstan over the last, last century. 40% of population was killed through artificially designed famine called the forgotten famine. And for us, it was a story of reinvent or die. So I didn't know that when I was growing up because it was not safe to speak about before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I learned the story and the suicides and prisons and executions only when I was already an adult. But you have it uh, in your unconsciousness. Your parents behave a certain way and they give you particular wisdoms uh, so that you survive. And they became part of my academic work and then later in my business work. You may be interested to know we, we cover a lot of stuff on the brain on this show and they showed that actually that those genes do pass on. For example, fear can pass from generation to generation, but so can survival. Like, you know, the whole idea, there's a, there's a term called hermesis and hermesis is a little bit of poison is good for you. And they discovered this with uh, vegetation, for example, they discovered that vegetation that had a little bit of poison on it, that wasn't good for it, was stronger and created stronger genes. And therefore, if we consume them as humans, we benefit from those genes as well. And I, I thought of that when I looked at your history and all that, that it's in your genes, but also that you harnessed those lenses through which you see the world. And that's your mission, that's your vision, that's your goal to give this back to the world, these reinvention tools. And it's also my dad, right? So my great grandfather uh, was executed and my grandfather at age 12 was sent into an orphanage uh, house uh, 3,000 kilometers away from his home in Russia, language he never spoke before, in a cold environment. And since that point of view, he was branded the son of the enemy of the state, which meant he never could live in a major city. He was never allowed to do any meaningful work and so on. 
So he lived his life, had two sons, he fought, he was in prison many times because he was an outspoken journalist and he killed himself uh, at the end of that life. But he was 40 something when he killed himself. So he never seen one hopeful thing. He never seen why. He didn't have a chance to see his big why. And his big why is my daughter, is a person who has endless, it's me, right? So I have amazing opportunities. I live uh, in many different countries throughout my life. I've had blessings upon blessings. And he had to keep faith, knowing that he might never even have a second of return on that faith. He had to keep faith that would materialize two, three generations down. So I feel like it's a, it's a huge debt to a whole life, not just a part of his life was hard, a whole life that was tremendously difficult. So that um, two, three generations down, we would stomp around uh, with our last names and um, get the amazing blessings that we enjoy right now. And speaking of those blessings, I, I often think of a story I heard once. A friend of mine is has a private jet, so he, he's a very wealthy man. And he does this thing where he flies over anybody who needs treatment, say, for, the, for in the USA, right? So he'll fly them over and he'll take care of that, so take that burden away. And there was one kid, and the kid is had never, ever traveled in public plane before. So he'd only traveled because he was going over for these treatments. And his parents told the story that when he first went on a public plane, he turned around to his parents. He's like, Mommy, Daddy, who are all these people? <laughs> and he started to cry. And I share that because it made me think of we don't know what we don't know. So, for example, we are born into such privilege, into such a peaceful time in general, in, in the general history of the planet. In, the, in our time on the planet, it's been quite stable. And when you talk about your history and the history of your family and that of your parents and grandparents, it was very traumatic and it was very, very chaotic. And we are now entering into a period of somewhat chaos again. But but it, it's always more difficult. It's like that child who's traveled private and now all of a sudden has to travel public. And there's a turbulence in that. There's a there's a and a readjustment in that. And we need to get used to that. And this is a thrust of so much of your work and this book. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I build, of course, on thousands and thousands of thinkers. And uh, I am a big believer in reinvention. I believe that most of what we need has in some form already existed. And one of those thinkers, of course, is an, an amazing, uh, remarkable uh, any kind of genius, Peter Drucker. And he was the one who said, uh, when turbulence comes, it's not the turbulence that is dangerous, but it's using the old tools. And that's what we are going through. It's not the turbulence itself, it's our attachment to the tools, to the theories, to the beliefs that were created for the stable times, that were wonderful in the stable times, but today in today worlds are not relevant anymore. And those are the tools that we kind of take for granted. So a lot of our assumptions in business, for example, things around strategy, terms such as sustainable competitive advantage or just in time inventory management, all of them came from the era of exceptional stability that worked wonderfully then, were relevant then, and are very dangerous right now. So let's share some of the ways you set context in the book. You said in 2010, in the middle of yet another crisis, researchers showed that during the recessions of 1980, 1990, and 2000, 17% of the 4,700 public companies they studied did not survive. They went bankrupt, they were acquired, or they simply were dismantled. Such fates are expected in any significant wave of change. But here is what is striking. 9% of the companies not only survived in the chaos, but thrived, beating the competition by at least 10% in both sales and profits growth. That is what we're after. That's what you seek with this book and with your work in reinvention. Absolutely. So we are trained to see turbulence, disruption, crisis as something exceptionally negative. This is a 
leftover of a stable era where stability was the home base, was the standard, the golden aspirational place we all were aiming for. And instability was perceived as abnormal, as a sign of unprofessional management or lack of uh, success and uh, expertise or some sort of rare, unfortunate event. Today, we're entering at a time where uncertainty and disruption is the norm and stability is abnormality. And it means that we have to shift the fundamental question that we ask ourselves. So when the COVID-19 started, I was asked this question nonstop. How do we make it until things stabilize? What do we do to make it to the moment when stability comes? And the answer is you cannot do anything because that moment is not on the horizon. Whether we look at the data of the World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Fund, or if you look beyond the economic stability and look at the data in the social and political stability or environmental stability, there's simply no evidence that we will stabilize. So the central question is not how do we stabilize or how do we survive until things stabilize, but how do we thrive in constant uncertainty and disruption? And that brings us to this current disruption, this pandemic and what's coming as well. I, I think many of us have the illusion that we will go back to some sort of normality. But I really believe there is going to be no more normality because apart from pandemics, which we're now aware of and we haven't been aware of in our lifetime, we are going to see disruption from artificial intelligence, automation and technology that's going to totally disrupt the tectonic plates of the socio-political landscape and business landscapes. And you say in the book, just as with COVID-19, every time a crisis started to descend upon the globe, it unleashed a wide variety of questions and particularly questions in leadership and in boardrooms. I'd love if you'd share those type of questions that people come up with when they, they confront crisis. Well, the typical questions are, uh, what are the simplest steps we can do to stabilize? How do we cut the bleeding? How do we survive until things become normal? And so on. So it's uh, two things, two underlying assumptions. One of them is that stability is good and disruption is bad. Uh, two, that uh, we need to think short term and fix the immediate uh, situation, put out the immediate fire. And then, of course, that change is a kind of project that you do one time and you move on. Those are the assumptions that stem from stable world, from very long life cycles of business models and companies. So, you know, from my research, uh, we have a lot of evidence that show that in the 20th century, the average life cycle of a typical company was very long, anywhere between 60 and 75 years on average, based on different research. Uh, this year, we closed our global reinvention survey in September, and the data shows that today, 60% of companies have to reinvent every three years or less, every three years or less to survive. This is a remarkable shortening of life cycle and exceptional, exceptional acceleration. The rules of the game of living in a cycle of 75 to living in a cycle of three to seven years these are completely different rules of the game. And yes, we can be out of pandemic, but every kind of other disruption has shortened that cycle. I'll give you an example. In 2013, Oxford University did the FAME study on the impact of automation. And this study showed that, for example, in the US, 47% of all jobs will be automated. A computer uh, automated algorithm or a robot can do it faster, better and cheaper. 47% of jobs. It was a lot of debate and a lot of um, active uh, negative reaction because you can imagine 47% of people unemployed. What in the heck do we do with these people? Um, I was just looking at the research of this year that is combining uh, quite a lot of different sources and their fields for example food industry hospitality industry where about 73 percent 
of all tasks can be automated. Not 43, 73% of all tasks. That's a disruption at the magnitude we simply have not yet thought about. So if you think that COVID-19 is our biggest issue, this is just a warm-up exercise for the constant disruption we'll be facing in the next decade and more. And if anything, COVID's going to be an accelerant because it's digitized things quicker. I mean, even the smallest organizations are starting to digitize and use tools like Miro, we'll talk about in a few minutes, but tools that they would have never thought of before. Even in our roles as facilitators, working with clients, we have to do it digitally. So we have to engage the digital tools faster than we would have done in the past. But I wanted to bring it, Nadia, to zoom in. So we talked about industries here changing and being disrupted, but also the leaders of those industries you tell us in the book only 44% of today's industry leaders have held their positions for at least five years. 50 years ago, it was 77%. So the life cycle of a leader at the top of an organization is shrinking as well as the organism. Life cycle of success is shrinking. So it used to be you become a success, you become an expert, you become a professional. I put it in a quotation mark, not as a sign of skepticism, but this denomination. This is a true professional. This is an expert. This is a best practice. This is a success case. This was excellent idea in the 20th century. We all studied those business cases. We love the stories of success and they're wonderful. The shelf life, of those successes is becoming very, very short-lived. So we are looking at individuals and corporations that are drowning successes. That used to be an untouchable, unsinkable titan of business and a matter of months and years, no more than a few years, these companies are drowning successes. So this is a wake-up call also for us professionally. If before I come from academia, my background is being a professor, before you come in as an expert, the expert is the one who knows the answer. Today, the person who knows the answer is one of the markers of low expertise. If you know what's going on, you're definitely... um, not not a professional because there's not a single person right now who are thoughtful, reflective and deep who can say, I know what's happening. It's too much uncertainty. It's too many complicated feedback loops. So uh, the sign of an expert right now is I don't know the answer and I'm willing to find out and I'm willing to unlearn. I'm willing to give up successes of the past and be the one who looks at everything from a fresh land. Our work is so aligned, Nadia, yeah. and uh, Nadia is kindly reading and endorsing my book as well. So Absolutely love your work. So one of the things that we both recognized here is not only is it the life cycle of organizations or leaders of those organizations, but us, the professionals themselves, we need to pay heed to this work because our parents, you know, if they were lucky enough, worked in an organization for most of their lives, research shows that we will work in not only five or so organizations, but five or so careers. And I think, you know, when people look at a portfolio career now, they think that person may be a bit random and they think they might be a bit scattered, but that's edge behaviors. And that's what the future holds for most of us. And we need to educate people on this. You've been a college professor. We need to instill this mindset of reinvention into our children and into those people who are in college who still have time to learn this mindset. Oh, absolutely. So I often use the metaphor of snow. So if you live in in an environment, if you live in a geography where it snows regularly, you look at snow as something normal. You put out resources, so you have warm clothes, you have winter tires, you have equipment for cleaning the snow, you are prepared, you allocate time and resources so that snow doesn't become this big disruptor in your life. People who live in a warm environment where it snows once every 75 years don't need to do it. It's stupid, right? Why would you put aside so much money, resources, and time for something that may not even happen in your lifetime? So that's the same when we deal with change and disruption. When the cycles were long, when the typical life cycle of a company was 75 years, that meant I could graduate from college, enter your company, work in your company my entire life, retire from your company and never see one reinvention. 
So why would I need to know how to reinvent? Why would I need to allocate time, resources, expertise, invest in learning and so on to prepare myself for disruption? That was stupid. That was then. Today, when the cycle is re- six, three, four, five, I have I've known not a single industry where the cycle is more than 10 years and the average right now is six years for a typical life cycle of a company, then how in the world can you commit to one profession, one career, and one company? It's stupid right now. So we have to invest in reinvention the way we reinvest in everything else that happens on a regular basis. There should be time, there should be resource, there should be attention, it should be allocation of funds. We should know that every few years we start with a refreshing our skills, our competences, our best practices, and our environment. There's a quote, Nadia, that I absolutely love that I pulled from the book, and it goes as follows. Just like any other competence, managing change can be learned and developed into a strong managerial muscle. The problem is that most of us in business are expected to improvise. We, have, we never hold practice meetings or give teams a few weeks of rehearsal time before the project commences. When it comes to managing change, however, the situation is even more dire. When building our businesses, we have a bias towards stability. And this is a huge problem. Like, and this will set us up for talking about the Titanic and your previous book, Titanic Syndrome. They did not practice the emergency. And if you don't practice the emergency, you're going to fail. Absolutely. So again, when the world was stable, that was wasteful time. Practicing plan B, C, and D was a waste. And I understand that I don't it all mean that we were unprofessional or we did something wrong. We did what was right for the last century life. For 20th century, having a stable best practice, having a conveyor method, sticking with what works, not messing with the winning formula, all worked great. The problem is that today in our disruptive world, What worked for us yesterday, a year ago, five years ago, could be exactly what kills us today. So without a regular refreshing process where we look at what's going on, where we let go of things that no no longer working, models, uh, product portfolios, uh, best practices, uh, standards, KPIs, and so on, letting go of things that no longer fit the new reality, allowing ourselves to test the new ideas, to practice, to give ourselves a little bit of rehearsal time. Without that, we simply are setting ourselves and our teams for failure because disruption is here to stay. It's either you start living in a new way or you're going to be dragged through the mud and see a, a kind of suffering that we're seeing this year. You use a lot of the terminology of the Titanic, of sinking, of drowning, etc. But there's a reason behind that, because it is in your vernacular. You have coined this term, Titanic Syndrome. It was the focus of our last show, and I'll share links to that show as well. We spoke at length about your previous book, Titanic Syndrome. And I'd love if you'd share what that is, because it is more relevant today than it has ever been before. Oh, absolutely. So I'll tell you a little bit of a backstory. I was a a chaired professor, Coca-Cola chaired professor of sustainability, and I studied why some big systems collapse and some systems survive. That was my focus of research. And uh, in 2007, uh, an executive education student, a president of a big company, was sitting in my class and he said, well, uh, you speak well, I almost believe you. The problem is you've never worked in business, so nice theory. And in 2007, I went to work in um, crisis management primarily. Our focus was helping companies figure out how to get out of a mess. We were a B2B business with no website and no business card until 2014, where we were not able to accept any new clients. And our old clients started saying, can you send us a methodology? Can you train us? If you cannot come, can you train us what to do? And that's how we started looking for terminology that could describe and in a concise, metaphorical, easy, visual way, quickly communicate to the corporation what is is going on and how to get out of it. And then I remembered a wonderful lecture by a fellow professor, Juan Serrano, where he used the movie Titanic 
to build some parallels between the ship and the story of the ship and the corporate environment. So my team and I went to research and what we discovered was just stunningly shocking (laughs) because you look at the story of Titanic and you feel like it has to be fake. There's no way every single one of those stories is real. And it's not just one thing. It's a, a manifestation of a systemic problem. So Titanic syndrome is a corporate disease where at a systemic level, company kills itself because of its own arrogance, because of its own attachment to the best practices and the status quo, because of its own inability to notice and adapt to the new emerging reality. And it stems from the story of Titanic, where the company didn't have binoculars. They had them, they were just locked up. They assumed they're so unsinkable that their lookouts would not need binoculars. This is uh, the radio operators who would routinely shut down passing ships because they were so obsessed with delivering the first class passenger notes that they would shut down in a very rude way. This is documented court data. In a very rude way, they would say to the passing ship that was warning them, come on, iceberg is coming. They were saying, shut up, get off my frequency. I'm delivering first class passengers. This is parallel to what we see in business today. When the company reached some success, they're so sure that they've got it, that they end up setting themselves for failure because they're not noticing the incoming warning signals and they become uh, the Titanics of the 21st century. One of those symbols or one of those signals that you talk about in the book is it's easy to blame the iceberg because the iceberg is so visible. It's very... but the, si- the signals of the iceberg start a lot previously, a lot earlier, and not, and not only under the water like the way we know an iceberg is, but other things like the sea, the air, the sky, they're all signals, but you have to be open to read them. Think about COVID-19, for example. Every time I was speaking at events and sessions and private sessions this year, I start with asking the participants, was COVID-19 a black swan? This is a beautiful term for, I know your listeners all are familiar with the term, is this idea that the black swan is something that was so unpredictable and so unthinkable that there was no way to see it coming. And many, more than 50% say, yes, it was a black swan. The problem with that definition, however, is that Every year, a number of researchers in many different outlets have warned that the pandemic is coming. For example, the World Economic Forum each year produces their risk report, listing the top 30 risks that are most probable and most impactful for humanity. And you will see right there, September 2019, a global pandemic was right on that list. It was explained, it was predicted, it was warned about. Not in the world is it a black swan when everyone have warned that this is coming. The problem we have is we assume that we have time. Because we all grew up in the stable world, even when there is a threat, It's so far on the horizon, we have time to adapt. So these assumptions, these beliefs come from the era of a very long life cycle. This is our school education is based on the idea of long cycles. We teach our kids to survive in a long, stable, predictable cycle. That's why we teach them answers, not questions. That's why we teach them how to be the best deep expert in one area rather than to be a generalist. All of those start from our early education. This is what we also pick up in high school. This is what we solidify in college. This is how our businesses are built. This is our managerial theories are all built for old cycles. So it's time for us to break out of those assumptions. You made me think of a brilliant guest we've had on the show, Michelle Walker. She said it's not about black swans, it's what she calls grey rhinos. And these are the big wicked problems we see coming for us, but we freeze and do nothing. So she's coined at this. I'll, I'll share the link to that as well. I love that. It's fanta- I love that. fantastic. I have it behind me here somewhere, but I'll, sh- I'll send the link to you. You will love her. She is so great. And I wanted to ask you that you mentioned about the children and teaching them 
answers rather than how to ask the right questions, how to be flexible in their mindset, etc. So there's not much we can do about the school system, but we can do things for our children. You have a 16 year old daughter, you may as well yeah. name check her here as well, give her a shout out. Yeah. But what do you do with, with her to instill a mindset of flexible, adaptable and permanent reinvention mindset? Oh, she is my reinvention teacher more than I am hers, I would say, right? So Lila is indeed 16. She's almost 17. And when you look at the baby, the baby is wired for reinvention. What she taught me is that this is our birthright. This is how we are set from birth. A baby who is not sick, and I, I, I understand sometimes we have real tragedies, but a healthy, normal baby is a reinvented birth. They are wired to test things out. They're wired to experiment and try new things. They do it because it's a natural thing to do. So you don't have a baby who is laying there and like, until you pay me a bonus, I'm not going to start walking. Just not my thing. It's not happening. Every baby is constantly trying something new. When the child then reaches the school, it's the school system that starts telling them, sit down, shut up, don't move, don't try, don't speak, don't experiment, don't ask questions, be quiet, raise your hand and shut up for most of the time of the school. So it's the uh, installed socialization. It's not a biological uh, normalcy. And that's what she taught me. And preserving it is more uh, the task than instilling it because this is the natural thing. So how do we preserve it? Uh, as long as I remember, before giving her an answer, whenever she would ask me what to do, I would say, figure it out, Google it, ask questions, figure it. no answers. Uh, she wants to know how to bake, figure it out. First try, make a few messes, and then we will figure out what will be our hypothesis for a moment. Uh, everything that we discuss in our family, there's always this little saying, but that's not for sure, right? It's a, just a hypothesis. Everything we do, this comes from the, uh, the customer development uh, literature. This comes from lean startup literature, this idea that anything you do is not an axiom. It's a hypothesis. It's just a Let's try it out for a couple of months and then see. And then some of the things are rituals. So things that you can instill in your kids is having a regular ritual, something like every quarter, where you together as a family ask ourselves, okay, what do we let go and what do we preserve? That's a simple reinvention exercise. But if you instill the idea that it's okay to let go of things that no longer work and it's okay to try something new, just having that ritual on a regular basis. Okay, guys, what do we let go and what do we hold on to? That's already is instilling a reinvention mindset. Fantastic. And you made me think there when you were talking about the signals of change and also teaching children how to see the signals of change that you explained in the book that chaos that we experience is not the opposite of order. In fact, chaos contains a certain amount of order in itself. And by understanding that, we can start to spot trends, we can start to have lenses through which to see the chaos and spot order in the chaos in order to be proactive and, and take advantage of this. And this is one of the big drivers of you. So maybe you'll share that story about the order in the chaos. Absolutely. And then, and then we'll get into Miro because Miro was one of these organizations who profited hugely from order in the chaos. Uh, so for me, this was a gift to spend some time reading the scientific literature on chaos. Because like everyone this year, I, I run a group of companies and one of my businesses is uh, hands-on, full-service crisis management, which means that I, I fly to a location and I live there for a long period of time. And for the first time in decade or more, I haven't flown anywhere since March. I, I don't even remember the time where I would sit in one place uh, for so long. But because of COVID-19, I don't fly. So for me, that was a different form of chaos. Being in one place is a very unusual experience, which disrupted the team, disrupted my family. They are not used to me being at home all the time. Even my cat was surprised that what the heck are you doing here all the time? So all of it is a disruption. So reading a little bit on, chem on chemistry, biology, physics, and mathematics, the sciences who study chaos from the point of view of 
actual uh, core data and science gave me such a freedom in the moment of chaos. And the best one that I discovered is this analogy from a geneticist, uh, Dr. Lipton. And he studies chaos from the point of view of biology, and he gives this uh, examples. So if I mean, you imagine yourself in a train station, and you are in, a, let's say, a, Uh, central of London or in uh, New York Grand Central Station and it's very busy before COVID-19, very busy everywhere and you're standing right there and you're seeing people moving in all direction and you look at it and you're like, okay, this is chaos. When I ask people, what's your association with the word chaos? Most of them speak about disorder, randomness, unpredictability. So when you look at the train station, everyone is moving in every direction. It feels like disorder. But here's a crucial distinction. When we talk about chaos, every moving person in that station actually is moving in order. They have a purpose. They have a plan. They're going from a train or to the train or they're waiting for their friends or they're going to a ticket sales. But there is an order in each individual place. What would be true disorder if I took a megaphone and I screamed fire and everyone would start randomly moving without any purpose? That's disorder. Chaos is not an absence of order. It's a presence of more than one order. It's each individual person moving purposefully, but there is a multitude of orders. And when you translate that to a business, what's happening right now is, for example, Some of us are working offline and some of us are working online. That's a two orders working simultaneously and we need to find a connection between them. We find a way that they are seamlessly connected. So a customer who is buying stuff online and offline is having similar experiences, having same customer support, having a seamless interaction between the two. When we have a simultaneous movement with electric vehicles and the fossil fuel industry combined. What does that mean? And how can we spot a new order emerging so we can jump on that opportunity and not be crushed by it? That's the freedom of understanding what chaos is. Beautiful. And that sets us up nicely for those organizations who have benefited from the chaos. And and not by chance, because I think Sometimes people think, you know, you were lucky and there is a a certain amount of luck involved in that maybe your industry has come of its time. But also a lot of these organizations who have thrived in chaos had been building capability for a long time before the opportunity came. And when the opportunity came, they were ready. And one of those is Miro. Yes. Um, I love this company because I'm a user. So I know them when they were still called real time boards. And they were the first company that understood that we are going virtual, that digital is inevitable. And we have to create uh, collaboration environments and platforms that mimic uh, some of the things that happen in real life that simply are not yet delivered virtually. So what Myra did, they created a virtual digital version of how we can all stand in front of one wall with sticky notes and co-create things together. They even visually <laughs> create sticky notes. Even you, you can have a draggable visual sticky note that everyone is dragging while sitting in US, China, Kazakhstan and Ireland simultaneously. And you can see uh, what is being dragged around and what's put on a sticky note. Uh, and the remarkable story of this company is that they've reinvented very proactively many times, including rebranding, including repositioning. They became professional at adapting super quickly to anything that is going on. And that's why they've grown so much in this crisis, the way Zoom has grown up so much in this crisis. It's companies who noticed the trend long before others were able to recognize it and invested, as you suggest, in in this capability uh, in an advanced preventative measure. So they were riding the wave of change rather than being crushed by it. One of the organizations you talk about, so you give a few case studies. Miro was one of those organizations which was almost a greenfield site but had the flexibility of, of mindset to change name and adapt to the current situation. But one that was a lot older 
that adapted and one that didn't was the case study you talk of Penzoni versus Pan Am. Yes. Uh, well, I met the Pinzon owner, um, co-owner, uh, at a yoga studio right here in Columbus. And we just liked each other. So all of us, my family, including Lila, was there. And, you know, you meet the CEO and the owner is sitting at the yoga, the mat, sweating next to each other. You just start talking. But here's a company that is 50 years old that is dealing with not super high margin business, which is a salon, a hair, massage, all of those, and is able to grow and scale when a company such as Pan American Airlines that was its own uh, institution. <laughs> this was a brand went way beyond the, the planes and the, the air traffic uh, service. This was a, a, such a brand that you would see it on clothes, you would see it on, uh, on jackets, on so anything you wanted. It was its own institution and it didn't survive while the Pinzone is around for 51 years and reinvented collectively many, many times. So I think the thing that distinguishes the companies that are able to reinvent aggressively again and again, systematically, is the humbleness, is the idea that you can never be too comfortable. You can never say, okay, I've done it. I'm good. It's over. We can move on. And that's why the opening intro of the book, when I tried to figure out, okay, what's the number one message I want to give and what, how do I title this, was change is not a project. It used to be that change was a one-time project. You'd survived, you settled, you have a new version of yourself, you're good, you're safe. Those who are not surviving are the ones who are thinking about change as a project. Companies that are like Pinzon are able to reinvent again and again are the ones who understand that change is a process, change is a system. And if I build a system that asks itself on a regular basis, okay, time to renew, time to reinvent, time to shell off the business models, the products that simply are not performing, how much I love them, it doesn't matter, how attached I am to them, doesn't matter, I'm letting them go because they're not performing. Other ones who are able, like Pinzon, like Miro, to be the ones who are constantly uh, reinventing and adapting. Beyond the case studies, we won't give it justice at all, do it justice, the amount of tools that you constantly give away both on your websites and in the book and across your social media platforms. But I wanted to talk about the Stellar Canvas, the Stellar strategy model. But before we do, I wanted to introduce it this way, because you talk about McGill University professor Carl Moore, who posed a fantastic question. He, asked, he said, there are two people whose ideas he believes were taught, should be taught in every MBA in the world, Michael Porter and Henry Mintzberg. But you contrast their two views as Porter's taking a more deliberate strategy approach, while Mintzberg, well, Mintzberg's emphasizing an emergent strategy approach. But which one is more useful is the question that is asked by Carl Moore and one that you emphasize heavily in the book. Oh, yes. So uh, full disclosure, I am a big fan of uh, Henry Minsberg, and I taught with Henry for many years and consider myself very, very honored to be part of an emergent strategy camp. So I'm not an impartial observer. I am fully involved with the theory. Um, for me, um, these two people and these two schools, deliberate and emergent schools of strategy, are the titans that mm, symbolize the shift this 20th century stable world where you can have a 10-year plan or even 25-year plan and the 21st century world where you have to think about giving yourself room to emerge what's asking to emerge, to emerge new product, to test and run experiments around new business models and to allow yourself huge flexibility. And here, Henry Minsker, of course, did us a huge uh, service when he delivered this idea that it's okay not to know and it's okay to allow certain parts of your strategy to dissipate and certain parts of your strategy to emerge in the process and it doesn't make you unprofessional or undisciplined or unfocused. It makes you adaptive and agile and ready to reinvent. 
And Stellar was an accident, to be super honest. So I had a client, a massive um, 80,000 people mining company. And one of the spin-offs in our reinvention work with them was to think about a balancing act, a diversification, where if you are a company that has very, very heavy assets, and mining is heavy assets with billions of dollars invested into infrastructure and so on, you need to balance it off with uh, an investment in a business that has a different kind of asset. I learned these lessons from the case of Bulgari, which was a, a, a jewelry house with the heavy assets in metals and precious stones. And this is the company was the, one of the first who would balance it off with a perfume business where most of your intangibles are the greatest asset, which is the brand. The actual mechanics of producing of perfume is very, very cheap. What you are actually investing in, what's on your books is the brand. So how can we balance it out? And the balance we decided to implement was a corporate venture capital fund, which is heavily invested in digital because digital is mainly intellectual property. There's relatively little physical assets. And of course, an old 60-year-old mining company suddenly working with these kids in jeans and ripped t-shirts that work whatever schedule they work and expect donuts and a whole bunch of ping pong tables in the office. And the company was going crazy. They're like, how in the world do we combine these two cultures? But even more importantly, how do we combine two planning systems? Because your old established business has to be run very differently from your new emerging business from a point of view of business tools, from infrastructure of management, how you uh, set KPIs, how you manage progress, how do you measure progress. So the first request was, is there a tool on the, on the market? Can you suggest something? And unfortunately, we couldn't find anything. So we developed this tool for this one client, and then our tribe of reinventors started testing it across many, many different industries and countries. We have a center of excellence emerging in Stellar in South Africa because it's been so popular in South Africa. And this is version 11. The one that is in the book is version 11. And it's a canvas. It's a very simple canvas that combines discipline and flexibility. And it does that by two things. Well, three things. Number one, instead of setting goals in absolute terms, you set them in intervals. So instead of saying, okay, I have a, a goal to, be, um, to go from 8% market share to 15% market share, you set an interval. So from 8% to 10 to 15%. That little shift, scientifically speaking, is showing a, a significant jump so if you set absolute goals, about 50% of people reach that goal. If you give an interval, it jumps to 80% of people hitting somewhere within the interval. Second thing, you set limits. You are very clear which limits cannot be crossed. And within those limits, knock yourself out, try anything you want. And third, you borrow from Agile and Scrum and Lean Startup and you think of sprints. So you give yourself regular intervals at which points you stop and say, okay, are we on the right track? So it's a very simple canvas, nothing genius, just put together into a usable tool that you can figure out how do I still do planning, but that planning has embedded flexibility in it. I thought we'd share one final but major element and that's that change is not a solo project it's a communal affair and you need to bring people on the journey with you because if you do try and inst instigate change alone it can be unhealthy it's challenging and so many of our listeners are change makers within organizations they work in innovation teams or entrepreneurs or are just trying to start up an organization or entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs and residents, so many of that mindset that you know so well, Nadia, and they need to engage and build tribes. And you talk about toolkits to do this within the book. So there's two toolkits. One is your immediate surrounding those people that surround you that you can influence. And then there's a wider community as well. I'd love if you shared these two exercises that people can use and, and take advantage of. Um, I want to point out one thing, um, first and foremost, uh, if you feel lonely, 
if you feel um, a little bit tired of leading change, that just means you're normal. Uh, the normal distribution that you can easily Google, and we do speak about it in the book as well, the law of diffusion of innovation tells you that whether you are trying to sell a new product to the customers out there or a new idea to your fellow employees in your own company, the distribution is always the same. Only about 2.5% of the world will come up with new ideas and about 13.5% will be easily adapting those ideas as early adapters. That's it. This is your tribe. The rest of the world will say, not so much, not interested, show me the proof. Not. And the resistance is a healthy, normal response. It's not a sign that you're a bad professional. It's not a sign that something is wrong with your delivery. It mainly means that people are healthy and normal. If they're resisting change, that's a healthy immune response from every organization. That's a normal thing. So number one exercise is to flip a switch in your brain from I'm a failure and I don't know what I'm doing to I'm normal and if people are resisting, that means I'm disrupting the system. Great thing. If they were not resisting, something was wrong. It was not resisting, it means I'm not making any waves. So that's number one. Number two is uh, surround yourself with very, very clear, very clear, simple thing, which is um, a support mechanism that is not a type of yes people, but the kind of people who are really giving you the right um, progress, the the right um, push, the right um, uh, balancing act between asking tough questions, but not draining your energy. So in the book, we give the exercise that help you get a sense for, uh, is this a person in my environment who is supportive? Is this the person who is neutral? And if this is a person that is toxic? So it's a very simple exercise. You go through the worksheet and you're like, okay, I know that I need healthy critical eye, but there's a difference between a healthy critical eye and a toxicity. So I need to make tough choices around how much time I'm spending with the supportive people in my community and how much time I'm spending with the toxic people in our community. Just as you say change is not a solo project, you also say it's not a punishment because it can feel like that sometimes when when it comes deep from within us. We, I call it, I say we because I know many people listening out there are like this, that you, it's, sometimes you feel like it's, you can't sit still. And some people say that, will you just be happy? Will you just be happy and smell the roses, smell the coffee for a while? But you are driven to change. It's deep within your DNA. And when that is the case, it can sometimes feel like a curse. But I think it's a huge blessing that you don't sit still. And I don't mean your mind is active all the time. I just mean that you're driven to make an impact and make a change in the world. And that's a gift. But you say it's not a punishment. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so if we look at big systems, if we look at the history of whether human system or biological system, the most sustainable system in the world, the one that survived every kind of disruption is the planet. And the planet is the one that will tell you first, nothing is the same at any point of view. There are cycles for everything. The planet is constantly renewing itself. It's constantly letting go of things. It's letting go of leaves. Our trees go through a renewal process. We give birth to new uh, leaves, flowers, birds, and so on. The natural part of life is constant change. The question is, how do we learn to live with that change and make it our friend rather than make it our enemy? Because it's not a punishment. It's not a wrath of God. It's not a sign of unprofessionalism. It's a sign of normal, healthy life on planet Earth. And that means we have to figure out how to live with that normal, healthy part of life. So before we finish up, because I wanted to finish the way you do the book with your final lesson, and it is to do with this idea of change. Nadia has kindly offered us a copy of her beautiful book. Here it is. It's in my hands here. And we'll give away a digital copy depending on where you are in the world. And I wanted to share this final, uh, final message from the book, which is change is not a punishment, and that it is 
exercise three or lesson three from this, you don't need to become a reinventor because you already are. You mentioned this, Nadia, with Ilya. She is a reinventor because she was born that way. We just taught it out of her, but we all have it in our DNA. We're born to reinvent. We're born to change like the leaves on the planet, like the planet itself. So what is the lesson three, the final lesson from the book? Every single person knows how to change. You do it every single day. You don't need permission. You don't need confirmation. You don't need anyone to tell you that you are chief reinvention officer of your life because that's a proof that you are a chief reinvention officer of your life because you're still here. You wouldn't be here if not for thousands of reinventions you went through in your life. And all it takes is to own it, to say, I am a chief reinvention officer of my life. And this is the way I'm going to look at my life from now on. That is the starting point. And the thing is, you already are, whether you know or not. Fantastic. Now, the end for people who want to download the unbelievable tools that you give away on your site with your reinvention community, where can they find you on your social outlets and indeed your newsletter? You will find us on learn to reinvent.com. So that's learn number two and reinvent, learn to reinvent.com. You will see tons of tools right on the home page. It's a homepage of Reinvention Academy. We have some tools for entrepreneurs like the business model cards. You can download the 85 page free preview of this new book, the Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook, How to Thrive in Chaos. And you can find many other tools. Learn to reinvent.com. And we are super happy to have you use the tools. Uh, you don't need our permission to use them. They're all granted with the Creative Commons license, which means you can use them in any way you want. And we are happy to welcome you inside our global reinvention community. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show, Nadia. And I look forward to your next one. There's so much content that you share with the world that we're bound to have another show in the next couple of years anyway. It's been a pleasure talking to your author of The Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook, How to Thrive in Chaos, Dr. Nadia Zek Zenbaeva. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Okay. I thank you so, so much. And thank you for doing such a good job going through the whole book. It's just oh, pleasure. Such, a much, such an effort for you to pick up on all these different pieces. Oh, well, it's, it's, an, it's actually an honor.